Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on the first episode of Grow with Farmers Cooperative. Uh, today I'm here with Galen Kuska and Alan Zumpf. Um, Galen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, like family farm, a uh, little bit of background on you. Okay, well I grew up on a family farm uh, near Milligan, Nebraska. I graduated from high school, went to college, graduated in 1981. Uh, moved right back to the farm. Uh, after that, started farming with my father, raised hogs and some cattle, and, and slowly grew the operation. And I uh, have a wife, Sharon, and three grown children. Uh, and been on the farm, same farm that my grandfather lived on. Been there since 1981. So it's a, it's a multi-generational farm. So yeah. I am the fourth generation. Fourth generation. So when uh, when did you decide you wanted to uh, join the board of Farmers Cooperative? Well, when I was probably four or five years out of college, I think it was in 86, they was asked to be on Melligan's associate director, run for that position. And so, you know, they were always a little bit difficult to find people. And so they asked me to run, and I... I reluctantly said sure <laughs> uh my when i decided to do that my father says you don't know what you're getting into <laughs> and he says because all you're going to do is get grief from everybody else because that's kind of back in the day the small co-ops you were kind of the one that you know when I something went wrong you were the one that heard it and why is so-and-so not working why but you've is... been doing it ever since though right so right it, and so the... it can't be that Right. Well, no, it, it turned out to be a great experience, but uh, it was just the start of it. That's kind of how it was. And, and so I was associate member for a year or two. Then I ran for the board, uh, got on, I believe, in 89. And then I was with Milligan until 96 when we merged with Farmer, or Dorchester Co-op. And then, uh, you know, we've had term limits. I happened every time we did a bigger merger, we reorganized the board, and I was fortunate enough to stay on the board. To stay on each time. And so I was on continually from 1989 to 2015. I finally got termed off. I was off a year. I was put on the nominating committee, and they said, you need to find somebody to run for your, your area, and they have them problems finding somebody and you so, couldn't stay away so they asked me would you want to run again i said it would be easier than finding somebody else so i ran again and and i was fortunate enough to get it on and now i've been on ever since so so i've had a lot of years into the system well, well cool uh and we're glad to have you so alan uh alan zumpf if, if you guys don't know he is the new president he is the new general manager and ceo of farmers cooperative um alan where where did you get your start in farming like family farm or just one day you you saw a field and you were like that's it <laughs> uh much the same as galen i uh, grew up on family farm um you know helped my parents uh spent a lot of time in the country and really enjoyed it um so uh, actually went to country school a uh, small school just three miles from where i grew up went to milligan uh, milligan high school so i've known Ga galen uh, for a lot of years um actually then went to university of nebraska i was going to actually going to do a uh, two-year associate degree and uh, go back and farm and that was in the mid 80s and uh, really wasn't there for me to go back to um went back two more years and uh Got uh, got in the grain business. Uh, yeah. Is kind of where I started. Uh, worked for worked for uh, Cargo for about nine months. Figured the corporate world wasn't for me. Had an opportunity to come to uh, to local co-op, and, and local co-op there was uh, Quad County Co-op in Exeter, actually mm -hmm. one of our farmers co-op locations today. Um, gentleman by the name of Al Coates hired me and uh, asked me to be a grain merchandiser to a newly merged company with uh, as they merged in Cordova and Fairmont at that time mm -hmm. and that was in uh, that was February 1988 I guess um, from there I just continued to progress in my career had an opportunity to go uh, be the grain division manager of the largest co-op at that time in Nebraska a newly merged company in Holdridge Nebraska uh, called South Central Co-op I was there till 2005 um, moved again came closer to home they had a, a management change there and didn't uh, you know kind of didn't agree with some of the philosophies and had an opportunity and moved to uh, york and uh, worked at uh, 
at United Farmers Co-op and then Central Valley Ag as the uh, Senior VP of Grain till 2016. Uh, became a CEO uh, at uh, Cooperative Producers, Inc. in Hastings in 2016, to where I've been uh, till November 1st till of, here. Uh, this year till here. Yeah. So what was the, uh, was there like, when you saw the job for Farmers Cooperative, was there like, was there one thing that you were like, I got to get that job because of this? <laughs> or was it like a, a bunch of, like, what, what drew you? What was that thing that pulled you in that you just couldn't say no to? Uh, you know, actually, I heard, uh, you know, I've, I've known Ron, uh, the previous uh, CEO. Uh, I've known him since 1988. I sat on a board of directors with him for 19 years and became uh, personal friends with Ron and have been watching this company from afar. Uh, my family are, are patrons of this company. And my brother-in-law is uh, um, very farms uh, near Exeter. And so uh, very familiar with the company. Um, and I, they, we were actually members of NIK, uh, both my previous company and, and a farmer, so knew a lot about Farmers Co-op, but um, you know, so so I, I watched the growth and, and watched the good things they're doing, and and um, you know, it was a chance to come home, if you will, uh, to get back to really where I started. So, like I said, Exeter is one of our locations. I grew up in Melligan. I, re I remember going to the annual meeting in the auditorium basement uh, <laughs> in Melligan uh, when I went to high school. Uh, the yeah. high school kids got to go to the annual meeting. So, um, you know, I know a lot of people and, and just a lot. It's a, you know, great area, good culture, um, and, and then obviously great company. So, it, it, combination of a lot of things. There wasn't one uh, lightning well, strike. One thing. Thing to, yeah, just a combination of a lot of things. So I'm going to get back to Galen a little bit. Uh, so you're the the chair of our board of directors. Correct. What uh, what made you want to to take that extra step up? Well, I don't know that it was my decision. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, you just when you start as a director, uh, you just get involved. You, you cycle through. And you cycle well. I mean, yeah. when yeah. I was initially started with Melligan, uh, you know, within three years, I was, you know, appointed to the chair of that company. And that's kind of how I stayed on uh, later on. At that time, I was, you know, pretty young, probably in my early 30s. And I said, I don't know if you want me to do this, because our previous chairman were all, you know, 70 plus years old and a lot of experience. And they said, oh, you'll do just fine. You know, basically nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you just, as the more you're involved with it, the more you know, and then the more you know, the more you speak up and you experience more things. And I think it's just kind of a natural transgression that I don't think when you join the board, you say, boy, I want to be the chairman of the board. It. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, you know, your peers select you. Uh, we reorganize the board every year after the annual meeting. And so, you know, might be here one year, two years, might be on for 10 years as board chair. You know, you never know. Uh, you know, uh, one question was actually posed to me recently. Um, so we send out a, like a packet, like a pamphlet with all of the possible new members of the board uh, and the patrons get a vote on it. Um, how, like, how does somebody either nominate themselves or nominate somebody else that they want that they want on the board, or if they themselves want to take that position, how do they go about doing that? Well, we have a nominating committee every year that goes out and, and sees, you know, what we're set up in. Uh, we've got what four districts, and then we've got uh, some more, several at-large positions, yeah. and so we kind of look at areas that are geographically that are deficient, maybe that need some representation. Mm -hmm. That's our main goal, and you know, obviously, if an incumbent's running. We will try to find somebody to run that's that's qualified. We would encourage, you know, we always look for people that do business with our company, all phases, fertilizer, grain, you know, agronomy. Make sure uh, we got everything covered. Because, you know, we have a, a lot of people that are interested in it that maybe, you know, are just, just do grain or maybe they just do fertilizer. And we really always look for somebody that's, you know. Multifaceted. Right. And so that's kind of our goal. I mean, we always encourage people with our young producers meetings and stuff to, if they're interested in the board, you know, as they get in more involved with farming and to, you know, look into it. And we're always anxious. We have nothing official, but we do have associate members 
from time to time. Uh, we don't have them all the time, but if we see an area that's deficient in representation, we will try to get an associate member to come in, which is basically a non-voting member, but they sit yeah. in on every meeting that we do. And uh, and so it's just, uh, you know, and then we go through and make sure that they're good good customers, they pay their bills, they, you know, we don't want to get somebody on that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you have a problem, we haven't had it, you know, for years, but there are times when somebody wants to get on the board just because they're mad and they want to and they want to complain they want to complain and they want to change something and those aren't the kind of people you want you know you want people that are positive you want, want change for the sake of for moving forward right because it's it's a big company and we want everybody to be successful that you know help everybody so i it's just this kind of a process and some years we have a lot of people interested and sometimes we have a hard time finding anybody to run depending on how well represented how they run. feel with the person that are representing them today so you know, it's not unusual to have somebody run unopposed. Yeah. But we try not to do that, but it does happen. All right. Uh, Going to switch directions a little bit. Um, talk about co-ops in general. Um, they they seem to be getting bigger. Uh, and if you look online, that seems to be the – a lot of people are talking about co-ops getting bigger. Um, do, do either of you have a, a theory, an idea? Why do you think co-ops keep growing in size? Like, is there I'll, one? I'll start and you chime in. Okay. So you need to understand that uh, the most farmers we ever had uh, that, that were production agriculture uh, farmers uh, was 1952. And uh, coincidentally, that was the time we had the most co-ops as well. So mm -hmm. I can tell you that co-ops are more of a reactionary to what's going on in all of agriculture and its massive consolidation. Um, today, if you, if you go and, and look how many uh, producers we really have today, um, if you look how they're categorized by the IRS, we're probably under 200,000 farmers in the United States. But actual in production agriculture, what we consider farmers, uh, it's much less than that. Yeah. And, and that trend appears to be going to continue. So cooperatives are much the same. Um, you know, we continue, you know, we compete every day with, uh, with, with world, with uh, people all around the world, um, with, with the Internet and, and the ability for people to source products uh, online. Uh, there will continue to be consolidation at all levels, not just co-ops, co but uh, at really all levels of agriculture. I mean, I mean, you hear about it in in different industries all the time about this company and this company coming together to to form. So, no, that uh, that all makes sense. Um, so, the role of the cooperative is probably a lot different today in the farmer's life than it was maybe a hundred years ago. Uh, like, how do you like that relationship over the years, like? How do you think that – so, like, you just said that we're reactionary. So I guess that would almost answer my question that as the farmers need it, we come up with the service. Yeah, I, I can tell you that the, the, the basic concept why co-ops were formed in the first place is still – the principle still is still alive and well today. Uh, cooperatives were formed back in the 19, early 1900s um, to, to help producers do things they couldn't do for themselves. And so finding markets, sourcing products, that, that was the base concept of why cooperatives, why people came together uh, to be able to do it, uh, you know, at, under the cooperative model. Um, there's not a lot of change from that concept. Now, do we provide different services? Absolutely. The, with the advancement in technology, the ability to provide uh, much different services uh, is, is alive and well. Um, today, we're, we're, we're sending grain all over the world, for example, through our shuttle train network. Um, from the standpoint of agronomy, we are sourcing product from all over the world to be able to find the most cost-effective solution for producers. We're looking for ways to provide opportunities for producers to become to, to do things for less cost and to, to try to add value for their output. So um, while, while the base principle hasn't changed, obviously the products and, and, the, and the mix and of how we provide services has changed and will continue to change. It's, it's going to evolve as, as the demands and as the needs and as the opportunities arise. Well, I know I was speaking to our uh, precision ag manager the other day. Um, I w could not believe some of the uh, – how specific and scientific we can get 
with just dirt like that blew me away um one thing i, uh, I want to do on each one of these episodes uh we're going to call it hashtag farming fail um <laughs> so i hope you uh you have a good story but i want you both to tell everybody a story about something that you did or happened to you uh like on the farm or in agriculture that you did that is just hilariously embarrassing um you want to go first? You want me to take that one? <laughs> what you got, Galen? Well, you know, as I think, you know, human nature will tell you if you messed up, you tend to want to forget it. <laughs> well, we're here to bring those memories so back. So I'm, I'm, a lot of things that have happened to me, and there's been a lot of them over the years, but, you know. So we can make I, a whole series I don't want to be said it was my fault. But uh, uh, one interesting story I remem- remember years ago, I was helping my father move some cattle panels to the pasture. And it was, I had a cell phone, but it was just the very beginning of cell phone. And, Back when they and, were that big brick. That and we had an old old pickup. We hauled our cattle panels on, and we hauled them to the pasture about two and a half miles away from home and, and unloaded them, got them all ready, and then the pickup died. So, all right. So I says, Dad, so use your fancy new phone and call, call your mother and have her pick us up. So I called while nobody'd answer. I said, is she home? Yeah, she's home. She says, try again. So I said, try it again, nobody answered. So I said, well, let's start walking. You know, maybe somebody will pick us up. So we started walking. <laughs> About every half mile, I'd stop and try calling, nobody answered. answer. Got a mile, still called, nobody answered. God, what happened to your mother? You know, she's probably laying there, something happened to her. So we finally get about half mile from home and somebody finally drives by picks us up takes us into the yard and so first thing you know in the house we go you know what are you doing we've been trying to call you isn't you know isn't galen's phone working oh yeah she says i have phone rang all the time she said but she says i'm baking pies and by (laughs) god i'm not gonna stop baking pies it would just ruin them to go help anybody do anything i mean you got to give her credit there she was thinking about you guys so (laughs) so we uh ended up walking two miles because my mom was too busy baking pies and see all that means is that you burn enough calories (laughs) to enjoy those pies guilt-free so you know stories like that i mean i remember uh i don't know how many you want but uh my uh when my after my dad passed away, short on labor, so my wife, who is a professor at the University of Nebraska in the College of Architecture, she said, I, "I'll stay home with you on Friday and help you harvest." So I says, "All right." She's never been in a tractor. She was a farm girl, but never in a tractor, never ran it. I said, "I'll have you in the grain cart." So I get her in the grain cart and I give her specific instructions, you know, detailed. I said, "Now, you know." push this lever first when the auger comes up and push this lever second and make sure you do it in reverse order you don't want to shut the pto off before you fold the auger and got it so she, and she's she's very intelligent so she i knew she had it so we went we started out slowly and we unloaded and went to the truck and showed her how to do everything and so we got all done and i says all right you ready she said i'm ready so away we went, made around half mile field. Of course, I couldn't see her, you know, and got her un- got unloaded. She headed off to the truck. Comes back on the radio, and I says, I said, well, did you get, did it work good? She said, it worked great. Did just what you told me. I says, well, good. So I get back to the end of the field, and I look, and there's a big pile of corn right on the back of the truck. And I says, I thought you said it worked good. You said it worked really good. I said, then how comes there's a big pile of corn on the ground? She says, well, I did what you said. I went slow. I loaded it up. She says, and then the truck was getting full, and I shut it off. But she said, it just kept coming till I, you know, I said, why didn't you back up? She said, you never told me how to put it in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give full so, direction. Yeah. So, so she, she was right. I uh, never gave it. Okay, told her how to put it in reverse. So we had one more lesson to learn. But Hey, you know. If every day you learn you learn something new, then you're probably doing it right. Yes. There so go. I'm not a very good teacher. <laughs> you no. You I wouldn't say that. You taught with experience. It's just a different kind of teaching. <laughs> yeah. What you got, Alan? Uh, probably the most one that I remember most vividly is uh, started my new job in um, 
uh, Holdridge, and it was probably a year into the job. And um, I always had a uh, cement rattlesnake sitting on my desk and lots of different stories about it. Co- full cups of coffee farmers. It would be covered papers. They'd move the paper to look at my screen <laughs> and scare them, and they'd dump coffee on my desk. And and I had an assistant there. Um, name was Dana, and she uh, deathly afraid of snakes. And so one day, myself and a gentleman by the name of Mike Vaughn were going to play a trick on her. And back when we hand-wrote contracts, we were going to put the snake underneath one copy of the contract, and then we were going to ask her for a copy of the contract. And when she opened the door, the snake is staring at her, right? What could go wrong with that? It sounds like a perfect Um, plan. Perfect plan. And it was, except my boss had all the area co-op managers downstairs for a meeting as he was running for the board of directors of farmland industries at the time and he was having a kind of a, a, a information meeting and and trying to gather support for his election so we probably didn't want anything crazy happening yeah and uh so it, it just was timing was horrible and anyway dana came back from lunch we asked her for a contract and she proceeded to start screaming and I couldn't get her to stop screaming along with screaming obscenities at me. <laughs> and uh, so you can about imagine my boss come running up the stairs. Ron Jurgens was his name. Come running up the stairs. And it was one of those, what the hell's going on up here? <laughs> and I'm like, Ron, I played a joke and it backfired and it's all my fault. All he did was turn around and walk back down the stairs and he never asked me about it ever again. But I was <laughs> I was pretty sure my career may be very short. So how realistic of a snake are we talking? Like uh, it looks pretty realistic. Like yeah, I mean I don't like so. snakes, so you'd probably get me with yeah. it too. So uh, I gotta ask, do you uh, still have it. I do still have it. It's in a box. It will be on so, my desk eventually. So what you're saying is don't trust you if you ask <laughs> oh, yeah. me to grab anything out of your office. Yeah, I won't I won't I won't have you. It'll just be sitting on my my desk okay yeah. well i mean so i grew up on a hog farm so this this is a lot quicker of a story but i i grew up on a hog farm and as kids my dad would we'd go in and help and then he'd give us a couple bucks and we thought it was the greatest thing ever but we had these cattle prods and as a young child you're gonna shock everything you you see why will not you uh but if you didn't know they hold a charge so you shock the wall you shock the a pole and you let go of the button, there is still energy in the end of that on the prongs. And as a young child, of course I'm going to touch it. And it shocked the, my hand. It gave me two little dots. And then uh, inside the, the, there was like slots so that when the pigs, you know, mm-hmm. went, it went away. And it turns out that a cattle prod fits perfectly through that little slot when you drop it, terrified. And uh, <laughs> my dad was slightly displeased. It, uh, it didn't go well for me. So you had to go get the cattle prod. <laughs> I, I don't remember grabbing it. <laughs> I think he got it, but I, my, my arms were probably a foot long, and it was, I don't think it would have worked. But <laughs> I don't remember going back in there quickly after that. I think he gave me some time off. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's switch gears again, talk some more about the co-op. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about investments because we're personally, I've worked for the co-op for I think about three, four months now, and it amazes me the amount of money that we're putting into towns all over the place. Um, I didn't know if one or both of you wanted to talk a little bit about maybe some of the some of the more prominent investments or some of the bigger investments. Uh, so that maybe if somebody that's on one side of our trade territory mm-hmm. didn't know that we built this or we did this, or is there anything that comes to mind that you would like to tell the world about? Well, I, I'll start. So dating back to 2002, since then, this company has put up 66 concrete silo grain storage bins. That's a lot of bins. That's a lot of bins. And it's about 40, plus all the steel bins, it's about 42 million bushel storage. And this year, uh, the board just uh, um, voted and passed our capital expenditure budget, and we're going to spend just short of $30 million this year Thanks, on Gary. new stuff again. <laughs> and uh, for that, we're going to build about three mi- another three concrete tanks and a steel tank, about $3 million bushel worth of space. So since 2002, this company's added about 45, 46 million bushel worth of space oh, wow. to the company. Along with that, um, has invested in a lot of communities. And... Um, I, as I look around and, and, you know, from my career, I've been around a lot of Nebraska and mostly the large cooperatives. 
Um, this company by far has out um, spent, but also invested, I guess is better terminology, invested in a lot of different communities, not just a few communities where that, that we're seeing a lot of these other, other co companies do. And so I, I, I think about Milligan and I think about Ohio and, and Birchard and, and Odell and um, Emerald and, and where we have put um, storage facilities handling uh, speed and space is kind of the terminology we like to use in the business uh, adding speed and space so farmers can get in and get out get back to the field um, so those investments are it's um, it's it's yeah it's it kind of is mind-blowing of how much investment this company has made and you know you look at our tagline and investing in our owner success and that's alive and well and will continue to uh, to happen here so good I uh Another note, I, uh, I just put together our 2019 hunger booklet, um, and it basically, you flip through it and you can see everywhere we as a company gave money to backpack programs and uh, food pantries. Mm -hmm. And so we gave $67,000, and that was spread across Nebraska and Kansas. I don't have the exact locations, but, mm -hmm. and that money is raised by employees and managers, the company, and uh, just the businesses and vendors that we work with uh, were kind enough to give us money. So yeah, so $67,000 went back to these places. So it's not just the bins and storage and everything. It's, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we do to help. That yeah, I think I think what's interesting if you if you dig deep and you look at uh, look at Farmers Cooperative as a whole, 600 employees, uh, we're in 62 communities throughout uh, kind of south central southeastern Nebraska and, and uh, northern Kansas, I guess if you will. Um, tremendous amount of investments, pay a lot of uh, property taxes. Um, support a lot of the activities and, and the, uh, the hunger program uh, a lot of it is matching money uh, yes. coming from uh, Land Lakes has a program there's also matching funds through CoBank and, and other other companies as well but uh, um, yeah uh, those, those are great programs and, and we want to support those and, and believe it's uh, part of our responsibility if you will and it's it's a lot of fun going out and we have a giant check and I don't like it is it's so much fun handing somebody a giant check like i didn't think it it makes like it makes me as just as happy as i think it does them when i get to hand them this obnoxious four foot check um, they don't want to keep it though do they <laughs> well some people have said so i can take this to the bank mm -hmm. right i was like well you could try yeah i don't think it cash i think no. it'd be i mean yeah so doesn't fit in the machine yeah probably not <laughs> take a picture of their phone yeah. put it in an envelope stick it in the yeah, atm there you go. so it sounds like, like so you mentioned a little bit about some of the smaller places that we make investments, uh, but that's almost like, from what I can tell, it seems like that's why we can keep making these investments because we're, we're, putting, we're putting things places that other people might not, and it's paying off so that we can keep investing elsewhere. Does that sound? Well, I think the, our, our patrons have responded. And, and our, we, we ju we're just finishing harvest up right now. We're actually still getting some corn out of the field, but uh, um, record volume harvest at Farmers Co-op. So handled just right about 88 million bushel this harvest, oh, which wow. is a large volume of grain to, to handle it at, at a very short, near, very short time frame. A couple of weeks, yeah. But, um, you know, the company besides that then finished its uh, audited uh, uh, fiscal year was and our audit was completed. We'll be having our annual meeting coming up January 14th and 15th in Creed and then in DeWitt. Uh, we're going to report a great year, um, you know, $13.2 million local savings, which is, a, which is a great year for this company. And I, I, as we talk with the board and, and we look at, look at our financials and look at how the year went, it was a very tough year in agriculture throughout the Midwest from, from bomb cyclones to flooding to uh, very challenged to get the crop in the ground, get to, in some areas. Um, you get in North Dakota, they still have 40, 50 percent of the crop still in the field. So a very challenging year. And, and while we may have been in the garden spot, um, our, our company, because of those investments that these guys have made since really since 2002 and before, um, they showed up this year. 
and and that allowed us to have a great great uh, bottom line and 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 then it just cycles then we can pay patronage we can build more assets we can reinvest and and continue to invest in our owner success going forward so you, you need to make money, and, and uh, a lot of good things happen when you have a good year. So you mentioned patronage. Um, I uh, don't fully understand how all that works. Uh, is there? Could you give us like your a brief explanation, maybe, or a, a summary of how that's kind of working? How do how do we how do we how do we deal with patronage? So so patronage, you're able to pay patronage when you make money. And, and it's a board decision of, of how much patronage is paid each year. And it's uh, first you have to allocate a portion of your savings or all of your savings. So what, what happened this year is we, we allocated to our patrons 50% of our save, local savings. So approximately $6.6 .6 million was allocated. And then half of that is paid in cash and half of it is paid into a non-qualified equity program. Um, so the checks will be going out after the first of the year. Um, and then once, once it's in an equity program, and then kind of we talked about earlier was um, we, we go to a revolving fund. And that is really where we're at today. So you want to talk about where we're at on age base and revolving <laughs> yeah, fund? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, when the, when the companies merged, everybody had that we, uh, our equity was of age of the patron. Okay. So we never really paid it out till you turned 65 and then you would accumulate your equity and we had some members that when they turned 65 are getting a check of a hundred thousand dollars or more uh that obviously challenges your balance sheet at some point yeah. in time uh so we went in 2002 after farmers co-op the dorchester plymouth merger and we decided to go with the age of equity which is the year is earned is the year we will pay it off. So there's no longer a age 65 a redemption. I mean, there there is, we've got one bucket with the age 65 that's still in there, but any equity earned since 2002 mm -hmm. is, Goes is based, off of based on, on the year it was earned. And so since that time, we've paid off from 2002 to 2009, 100%. So if you were 25 years old, in 2002, within a few years, you've been paid everything since you've earned but since you've 2009. Earned. You didn't have to wait till you turned 65. That was always something that the younger producers always complained about. Well, why would I do business with you? Because I'm never going to see that money till I'm 40 years down the road. So that's one reason why why we changed, and I think most co-ops have done the same thing. Uh, and and I don't know, you know, I still think today, you know, as being on the board and we look at equity and we, we think it's really valuable to our patrons. And I don't know if they realize, you know, the money that they receive from that is is why they do business with us. I still yeah. think they do business with us because of the location and, and provide the products and the and things that they need to serve them the best, more so than are we going to receive an equity check at the end of the year. Uh, the revolving fund was really put in place, though. Uh, it, w w as these companies became larger and larger, it needed to be put in place so we could return that money to our patrons um, of all ages rather than waiting. Because the other thing that was happening was is producers were farming a lot longer than age 65. Uh, we have a lot of our producers that are uh, – my dad still farming, and he's 85. And so, now not all, but there are some of those that are doing that. And, and so this allows them to continue to revolve that equity out. And, and again, you gotta make money to be able to do that. And you have to, it's a board, it's a board discretion of how it's paid out. And, and uh, like I said, we just, we just finished up. Uh, 2009 was a big year. Uh, so we paid out a portion of it last year and the balance was paid out this last this year. Uh, this, this last year, so. Yeah, and I think once, up until we switched to that, like you said, somebody that turned 65 was paid out. They would not be paid out again until their estate. Yeah. So if you farm from age 65 to 85 and then you passed away, you probably earned equity for 20 more years, mm -hmm. but never saw a dime of that and your estate got until it. your estate got it. And so now, you know, once we paid it, you know, after 10 years or whatever, the number's been 2009, seven years. So here you're 73 and you've been paid out everything instead of having to wait, you know, 
So it's it's been an advantage to everybody, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, it's probably nice for for younger farmers trying to start out too, and that way they can get a little bit of that money sooner to help build their farm if they didn't necessarily inherit a, a big farm from someone, or if they're trying to start more from scratch. It allows them to see the value of it quicker, right away, and, and that that's really a, a benefit from a young producer. And and some years we pay pretty good, uh, pretty good cash, and uh, it's a pretty good chunk of money. And some years it's not as much. But uh, at the same time, the revolving fund is a, is a is a very common program for because of all the mergers that have gone on, and and it's it's a good program. Well, good. Well, those are all the questions I have for today. Uh, I want to thank both of you again for coming in. Um, you can uh, you can listen to this on the podcast app on iPhones. It'll be on YouTube, Spotify. Uh, best place, just check our Facebook. We will always post links about it. Um, and we'll hope to see you soon. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.